and uh, now we look forward to a very special moment where I'm going to spend some time just chatting with Toby, and we'll try and have some time at the end also for you to ask questions. So thank you, Toby, for joining us. Yeah. So, Toby, I, I put together some questions here. And, That's not and, fair. <laughs> you, you can answer them any way you like, and if you want to talk about other topics, uh, please, you're welcome to. You obviously had a very stellar cardiac surgery career here at the clinic, and you saw a lot of the changes over time. Would you like to sort of comment about the early period and over time how you felt and saw things evolving? Well, it's interesting. I, I uh, was, uh, came here at the same time that uh, Mason was still practicing. And I, I have to tell you about uh, one incident that I did with Mason. Um, I was, I dug out, I was giving a talk, so I dug out the original angiogram. And I was looking at it on the then projector. And uh, Mason walked in and I said, come here, Mason, I got something that you might be interested in. So he came over and we watched it together, and he said, you know, I said, let me tell you what happened. He said, uh, the, the story at that time, the fluoroscopist used to lie on the floor underneath the table, and I was underneath the table, and Earl Shirey was pushing the <laughs> catheter, and, and they were using renograffin at the time. Mm -hmm. And the story was that if renograffin went into the, the coronary arteries, it would stop the heart. So you see this catheter goes straight into the dominant right coronary artery, and a full injection of renograffin goes into the right coronary artery. <clears throat> and sure enough, the heart stopped. Unfortunately, the film didn't have sound because you saw the catheter being pulled out. And I can imagine <laughs> the screaming that went on in the cath lab at the time. <laughs> and Mason said, you know, at that time, uh, with the heart stopped, we didn't know the, about external cardiac massage. And we had a big knife taped on the wall. And I came scrambling off from underneath the table and had to grab the knife and open the chest and start squeezing the chest. This was an 18-year-old kid with aortic stenosis. And uh, so um, Mason, in the process, said, told the kid to cough, and the heart started again. And Mason said, you know, I discovered something really important that day. And then I came back and did it on purpose. And you stop and think about the guts that he had to come back and do that. And then... I had an opportunity to follow, uh, Rene Favaloro had left by the time I got here, but I got to know him along the way. And in his 70s, Mason, or uh, Rene would go to a meeting and you'd be sitting on the podium with him and he'd have three colored pens and he'd be taking notes like crazy and underlining and the intellectual curiosity of that man was just amazing. Um, and then uh, obviously Fred came along with the internal mammary artery and um, you know, it was not until the New England Journal of Medicine came along that anybody in the rest of the country believed in the internal mammary artery. Um, and it was just incredible to see this whole evolution take place. And then Bill Proudfit was downstairs, and Bill uh, was uh, determining the natural history of coronary artery disease. So it was just an uh, amazing uh, group of individuals who were there who really defined uh, the major cause of death in the world and the treatment for it. And it was, it was very exciting and, you know, I was, you know, just kind of walking around starry-eyed most of the time. <laughs> so, uh, was there anything that particularly got you interested in the valvular side of things? Uh, any particular moment that you remember that, you know, this is really what I'd love to do? Well, I, I, I was trying to find a niche. Yeah. <laughs> You know, they had everything covered as far as coronary artery is concerned, uh, disease is concerned. And I always frankly thought that coronary artery was a disease, was a disease that was so big and so prevalent that the, there was like a surgical intervention was going to be the first, and then there would be a medical intervention, and there would be a, a prevention. And <clears throat> just like uh, tuberculosis was essentially, the first surgeons and then streptomycin and then prevention. So I thought that ultimately that, that it was going to go away um, as a surgical disease. And so I was looking for something else to do. And these people sort of did valves on a, as a sidelight. And I thought, well, hey, this is kind of interesting. So I, got, I had an opportunity at first to look at the different kinds of tissue valves as they came along. 
and then obviously moved into repair and uh, some of the other stuff that happened along the way. So th this was obviously an exciting time and cardiac surgery, yeah. had the incredible stuff happening all the time. How was it to transition into something completely different now as a CEO and uh, getting used to something quite different? It was terrible. <laughs> I was t uh, totally unprepared, and for those, those of you, um, I had never gone to business school, so I, I'm going to give you, it took me a couple years to learn this. You know those parentheses and P&Ls? Those aren't good. <laughs> it took, it took especially me, especially they're red. <laughs> yeah, it took, it took me a long time to learn that, but uh, anyhow, so I, I had had no uh, business training at all, um, and so the first year and a half, I would operate and, and be here in the office, and then I go home and read and study until I, my head went down on the desk. Um, and so the first year and a half or so were really tough. The other problem was that a couple things happened to me. First of all, when I was operating all the time, I was in the operating room, and so nobody in Cleveland knew me. And I used to go to cocktail parties and I'd be introduced as Anita Cosgrove's husband. <laughs> um, and all of a sudden that changed in about, 20, it seemed like in 24 hours. And the other thing I had to do is I had to change, I had to go buy clothes. I had to, I stopped reading the New England Journal of Medicine and the Harvard Business Review. I moved from the operating room to the boardroom. It, it was a total change and it was very traumatic. Well, you've been very gracious in helping Tommy and traveling with him and introducing him to various people and teams, etc. What advice are you giving Tommy? Ah. <laughs> I'm gradually unloading all my problems on him. <laughs> As he gets shorter, I get taller. <laughs> um, no, I, I think what I, I want to do is I want to do uh, try and introduce him to all the situations and people that we're involved in. Uh, so it's not going to come as the same sort of a rude shock that I got. Um, for example, I had never seen Fairview Hospital before. I had never seen our hospital in Florida mm. before. Um, I had not met any of these people. They had me locked up in room 34. Um, and so it was a, a big learning experience. And, you know, happily, Tom has had a whole different set of experiences and business experience, business school training, and uh, leadership uh, opportunities. By the way, I, I will, let me just sort of uh, divest, diverge here for a second. One of the things that I realized is that when I became CEO and being so unschooled, I didn't think it was good for me and I didn't think it was good for the Cleveland Clinic. So every year I gave the, list, the board a list of five or six people that I thought were potential replacements and uh, then we would put them and I wanted, and I, as I thought about it, I thought there was really sort of two things that wound up preparing people. First of all, leadership positions <clears throat> and uh, one of the things that's happened is that we've gone from uh, the program where we had a Department of Surgery, Department of Medicine, Pediatrics, Radiology, et cetera, to institutes. We now have, you know, way more people, 20-some more people who have got leadership experience, and we've got across the, and all of our hospitals now have a physician leader, and that's just been more opportunities for people to get experience in leadership, and now we've got about 300 um, doctors in some sort of leadership experience and you find that some like it, some don't like it, some are good at it, some are not good at it um, and, it, and so that's uh, I think 80-90% of learning about leadership. I think the second thing is the academics and so we've seen a lot of people now go off to business school, we've seen a lot of people um, internally um, the leadership training uh, and I, I think there's really sort of two things that limit our uh, capacity to grow. And uh, the first is financial, of course, but you know, there's a lot of cap capability to, uh, to borrow money. But the real limiting factor is leadership. Yeah. And if you've got enough great leadership, you really can go a lot of places. So uh, many of us have benefited from the wonderful courses and so on you put us through in, in leadership. But I had a question for you for our young aspiring leaders. What are the characteristics that you're looking for? And you've obviously hired a lot of people, a lot of experience. What are the characteristics? What are you looking for? What should people be doing as far as attaining leadership as department heads or institute heads and climbing the next step in the ladder? 
I, I'm asked that question all the time, and I always give the same answer. <clears throat> I think you <clears throat> take the job that you've got, and you exceed people's expectations of it, and you get the next job. <clears throat> and people uh, generally don't think that you're being noticed. I mean, I was killing myself here, yeah. and I didn't think anybody noticed. And it turns out, I guess they did. Uh, and I think you, people do notice who's really doing a good job. And so whatever your job is, I think you just drive it as hard as you can, and you'll get noticed, and you get the next opportunity. And um, uh, that's, um, I think, fundamental to growing your career, whatever it is, and whatever your aspirations are. All through your career, you've been very innovative, both as a cardiac surgeon, as a CEO. Uh, how do you drive a culture of innovation? How do you encourage that? And that's something that obviously CEOs have a influence on a driving culture. What would you say that are the keys to being a great innovator? You've got some 31, 30 patents. Well, I think, um, if you, first of all, we're, we're really blessed to be in an institution uh, that really was strange to start with and innovative. Um, and if you look back at the, the founding of the Cleveland Clinic, it was a whole new idea. Uh, certainly the Cryles uh, started it, um, and you look at the things that came along after that with uh, uh, Masons and uh, Renee and you know, a thousand other people that have gone, whether it's uh, artificial heart or dialysis. I mean, it was just part of the culture of the place to try and think about new ways to begin to help people. And it's continued right on now. I think we have 1,100 patents in the last 10 years uh, that have come out of this place um, and, and some 80 uh, companies. Uh, so uh, it is part of the institution. And I think the other thing you do is you uh, honor uh, people, you recognize people, whether it's financially or whether it's uh, with recognition uh, for what they've done. Um, one of the um, one of the the really great things I think that happened as far as innovation is concerned is putting the Cleveland Clinic innovations together, and that has given the impetus for people to take their ideas and actually get them into circulation out into the public. The other thing I, uh, I have to say is that almost all of the things that happen, happen as a result of thinking about patients. Uh, whether it was, um, you know, whether it was in the, in the um, area of uh, administration, and certainly the same day access came from that patient you probably all heard me talk about who called up and wanted an appointment in urology and was, um, got one in two weeks, but was in acute urinary retention. That made us stop and think, yeah. that made us stop and think, hey, listen, we gotta ask these people when do they need to be seen. And you know, on the other hand, you know, as we looked at uh, the issues in cardiac surgery, we saw strokes happening and we thought about, okay, how can we change the catheter that we have for aortic, uh, for a return from the heart-lung machine, or how can we, uh, get give um, less blood. Manny Roswell and I did a series of patients about 300 ventricular aneurysms we, or redos that we looked up. And it turns out that they were getting an average of 13 units of blood, and and telling us that they had hepatitis, and we couldn't figure out why. Well, it was all the blood we were yeah. giving them. So that led to a whole different thing. So you learn from the patients and the patients' problems. Obviously. With innovation, you're taking risks, but you have to, in a sense, take risks to fail. And what was the boldest decision you feel you've made as CEO over the last 14 years? Hmm. Well, it depends on when you want to look at it. You know, I'm sure that everybody thought it was pretty bold to, to do institutes, and now that kind of looks like, oh, that was not a big deal. Um, and then people think about, well, you stopped hiring smokers, and that was, that was a big <laughs> deal at the time, and it doesn't seem like such a big deal now. I, I, I think it depends on the time you look at it. I think a lot of people think that our international activity was a, a bold move, um, and now it doesn't look like uh, such a bold move. Certainly everybody would say, well, now you're looking at uh, London, and that looks like, but I think these things are all have to be taken in perspective of the time that you do them, uh, and I don't think, I just picked up the Harvard Business Review today as I was coming back on the airplane, 
and it, it talks about how you have to have a CEO who's going to be disruptive, and yeah. um, and it's important now to keep organizations moving that they have to be disruptive and looking at innovative ways to do things. And I'm stopping and thinking, well, hello, we've done, done a couple of those things. So um, it's interesting now you, you sort of started working on London, and obviously based on the experience of Abu Dhabi, that was our sort of cannonball shot in Jim Collins terms. Uh, do you think that we're going to see more globalization of healthcare? Clearly Mayo Clinic's now moving into London together with Oxford and various other people are trying to expand into that market apart from the Middle East. What are your thoughts about that? Well, if you stop and look at it, um, what does the world want from the United States? <clears throat> they, they don't want our refrigerators or our cars. They want our uh, innovation, they want our financial services, they want our entertainment, they want our graduate education, and they want our health care. Now, let me, uh, if you look at Cleveland and you draw the six uh, hour flight time circle around it, there are 500 million people who live in that circle. You take the same circle and draw it around Abu Dhabi, there's three billion people who live in that circle. And probably, and there's a, a lot of demand for services and not a lot of people providing it. So if you look at uh, opportunities, um, I think that the, there's a lot of opportunities outside the United States uh, and a lot of people who want our services. So yes, I think there'll be more people who are trying to do it. I would only say, and I think uh, Tom would probably, and everybody who's been to Abu Dhabi and involved in it would probably echo this, it's damn hard. Yeah. Um, and we've spent a lot of time and effort at it. And we, we made a very different decision than most other people have made. Um, a lot of people have said, we'll put our name on the door, we'll send you three administrators, and we'll collect a million dollars a year. I didn't think that really was what ultimately delivered value, and so we went all in. You know, we were involved in the design of the building, we uh, staff it, we've now got uh, people in the clinic, 5,000 caregivers there. Uh, we are all in on that building. I don't think there's a, a week that goes by that we don't have somebody from here flying over there for, to help with um, electronic medical records or to help with the building or to help with uh, hiring or all of those sorts of things. So it is an enormous effort uh, to do it. And I think a lot of people who have looked at it have not looked at it in the terms that we did in being all in, and we're going to do the same thing in London. You mentioned how difficult this is and mm -hmm. also the challenges of working in another country and to take it back to what people are looking for in the United States. I, I think people look at our healthcare system and you know, there are certainly some criticisms of it, uh, Cambridge Group and so on, but I think something that's missed is that for CMS uh, patients over, there, well, over the age of 65, our healthcare is probably the best in the world. But you've been involved with the presidential uh, group and the advisory board that was disbanded and so on. If you were more than just president, you ran president, Congress, et cetera, how would you change healthcare in the United States? How would you address all these issues? This is the voice of God speaking. <laughs> you were God. Yeah. <laughs> Well, first of all, I think you have to understand there's some, some realities in the situation. Um, uh, and I would say that um, there's, there, I have a couple observations. First of all, in the United States, we're moving increasingly towards government pay. Uh, the Cleveland Clinic right now has 62% of our uh, revenue comes from uh, government pay. Um, and, and, uh, so we're and we're going up 1% or 2% a year. And I suspect we're going to get to 70 or 70 plus that is paid in some respect by the government, state, or federal. Um, on the other hand, if you look at many countries around the world who started out as total government uh, pay for health care, <clears throat> they are moving increasingly to privatization. So my conclusion in, from this is they're really in a perfect system. Sure. Uh, it seems like both people have got, both systems have got problems associated with them. Um, I, you know, and, and let's, I'll, I'll get it right down to cases right now and what's, <clears throat> what's uh, currently going on in Congress. 
Um, I have been uh, very apolitical uh, on purpose through this whole thing, and I don't think most people, in, including the people in Washington, know whether I'm a Republican or a Democrat. Um, but um, if you look at the ACA, uh, it increased coverage, it improved the quality of care, it didn't control the cost of health care. Um, and so to me, uh, what they've done in Congress is, uh, particularly the Cassidy bill, which I am so pleased that it got defeated, and I stepped out on this one for the first time because I thought it was wrong in terms of form and also in substance. In form, they wanted to have a bill uh, it put in the Senate uh, on one week one, on week two, they're going to discuss it, on week three, they're going to vote on it uh, without any discussion without any testimony for Congress. And then secondly, it was going to have about 25 million people lose their coverage. And I thought it was a terrible bill. Now, happily, that uh, didn't ever came to a vote. But what I think we need to do is address what the root problem is, and that's not uh, taking the cost down, but at least controlling the cost of health care. And there's really, I think, two ways you have to look at it. The first way you have to look at it in terms of um, the things that are, we do, that government can do to help us control the cost of people who are sick. And, I mean, right now we've got uh, the cost of drugs going up uh, way greater, twice the, the rate or three times the rate of inflation. We still don't have interoperability. We have limitations on uh, how we can bring hospitals together in a system for to drive efficiency. Um, and uh, tort reform, uh, et cetera, uh, and uh, all uh, we have now in the last two years had 12,000 pages of regulation. Fascinating reading. <laughs> Barely can put it down. Good for insomnia. <laughs> um, but, um, but on the other hand, that, that means that's a tremendous amount of effort to, to live up to all those. And then we've got somebody in the hospital all the time. We've had 150-some inspections so far this year at this hospital. All that costs money. On the other hand, so the, by legislation or by administrative action, you could improve on those situations. On the other hand, we've got three things, epidemics in this country, that really have got to be addressed. The first is we continue to have 16, 18% of the population smoking, um, which is not coming down fast. We've got a crisis in obesity, and two weeks ago the, the CDC uh, pronounced that we now have 40% of the people in the United States obese, yeah. and that accounts for more than 10% of the health care costs in the United States. And as obesity goes up, so goes the cost associated with that. And the third, and you know, I'm going to get on my soapbox for a second here, is the issue of opiate addiction. And this year, there'll be 62,000 deaths in the United States from opiate, opiate overdose. Just for my curiosity, how many people here know someone who's died of overdose? So it, I, I guess the point is, it's in, it's in, all, it's in all of our society. That's more than the 58,000 that died in the entire Vietnam War. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I'd ask two things of you, because I think we're intimately involved in this. One is, we have to recognize that we can't just hand out buckets of pills to people because they had their little finger broken or their tooth pulled, or, um, and we have to think about how we uh, deal with pain. Uh, and the second thing is, I'd ask you all to talk about this because I don't think generally the population understands the magnitude of the problem that we have in the United States. And until they do, we're not gonna have the schools and the um, police and the uh, DEA and the uh, doctors all understanding how serious this problem is and how they deal with it. So please uh, help me with those two things because this is a very serious epidemic that we're dealing with and really um, until we're all working on it, it's not going to get fixed. You're, you're right. I mean, this is a terrible problem, and all of mm. us know people who have lost kids, and it's also older adults, too. Uh, we were driving through Ashtabula, my wife and I, just to visit the bridges, the covered bridges in Ashtabula, and we drove through a little town. I counted there were two traffic lights, uh, and there in their center community area, they had about 50 black flags of people who died from overdoses. This is just a tiny little place. It's just amazing. Well, there are two a day in Cleveland. Yeah. Dying. Yeah. yeah. It's just terrible. 
You touched a bit on the obesity epidemic. Obviously, we talk about health care, but we really should be talking about wellness care and prevention of a lot of the problems that are self-inflicted. Any thoughts about this? The politicians obviously don't really want to tackle this. How do we get people to smoke less, uh, eat more appropriately, and to deal with those aspects? Well, I think, you know, at the end of the day, I think it's got to come from the private sector. <clears throat> and some of you know this and some of you don't about what is done here over the last decade here. Um, we have bent the health care cost curve in our 100,000 employees and dependents. And we were, 10 years ago, uh, the inflation rate was 7.5%. Now it's flat, and last year it went down 2% uh, per member per month to look after. Our, and we did it with two things. We did it with wellness, with not hiring smokers, changing the food, uh, encouraging exercise with free curves, free Weight Watchers, et cetera. And then we went to disease management with uh, people who had hypertension, diabetes, asthma, hypercholesteremia, obesity, and smoking. And if they entered into disease management, we reduced their uh, cost of uh, their insurance. That has bent the curve. And I think that it's perfectly possible. I don't think it's going to come out of Washington because no politician who sees 40% of their uh, voters obese is going to campaign against obesity. Yeah, <laughs> sure. <laughs> so uh, it, it is it's an opportunity for the private sector to step forward and begin to do this. And right now, we've got 55% of people in the United States who are insured uh, through their uh, employment. Uh, and that is an opportunity to begin to drive um, wellness, if you will, and I, because I, I, I'm amazed at how hard it has been to get hospitals to step into um, the smoking issue. It just to me is um, vital. And the other thing I might add for people who haven't been here for a while or are not from here, uh, I'm very proud of the organization that we stepped out in a very major way about drugs and we do random drug testing on all our employees now. Um, and we do it for two reasons, one in patient safety and secondly uh, for the health of our uh, caregivers. Toby, could we perhaps open it up to questions from the floor? It scares me a little bit, but go for it. <laughs> These are all your friends. These are cardiovascular uh -huh. people. So. <laughs> I'm not sure that any of the guys who are residents uh, for Gary. me. <laughs> <laughs> So let me talk a little bit about the project across the street. Um, I've um, always been concerned that um, the teamwork was not a natural act for doctors. Um, and, you know, and we all got trained in silos. The nurses were over here, the PAs were here, the dentists were here, the doctors were here, et cetera. So what we're doing across the street is bringing our medical school, Case's medical school, uh, their nursing school, the dental school, the PA school, um, all into one facility. Uh, and just uh, by the way, so the first year, they're all going to be assigned a, a patient, and that patient is going to have a, a, a social worker, a PA, a dentist, a nurse, and a physician, a student, uh, all students look, following them right through their uh, education. And I think that'll begin to change um, the sort of team play. The other thing I, I've always been concerned about is <clears throat> I thought generally in education was way behind in using technology. Uh, and <clears throat> so we've gone out and looked at uh, where we could find uh, technology that begin to encourage this. Uh, the one that really I think is going to be a game changer for us is the use of HoloLens in our relationship uh, with Microsoft. And for those of you who don't know, HoloLens is a headset that uses augmented reality. And just to show you the power of it, 
The other day, I'm walk walking around a heart that's sitting out in space like this, a hologram. And you can actually walk all the way around it. And after I finish walking around it, they say, Toby, stick your head in. So I go like this. My head's in the left ventricle. And I'm looking up at the aortic valve from the downside in the mitral valve. Now, that is a view I've never had before, sure. um, <laughs> happily. Um, and uh, you can imagine, you know, the, and so we think we can now teach anatomy without a cadaver. The second one that's coming in there is our relationship with IBM. And if you stop and think about all of us, we are inundated with new data. Um, essentially, there are 5,000 medical journals turning out 900,000 articles a year. Uh, I don't think any of you can a, a read them or remember them if you did. Um, and the, so the total amount of knowledge in healthcare is by 2020 will be doubling every 73 days. Um, so no one can keep up with that. So we have put together a um, strategic relationship with IBM who's building on our campus um, to begin to handle, have Watson handle that kind of information and help us. So that's the use of artificial intelligence, and that's coming into the medical school as well. And Watson actually has been going to medical school now for the last three years, and Watson has learned to read the history, the physical, and the lab studies and give you a problem list as well as a doctor can do. Now that is awesome uh, power of AI, and I think equally awesome power of AR. Yeah, that's right. Questions, uh, Hani? Well, clearly the regulations are much more stringent and, uh, than they were now. I mean, I can tell you some things that I did that are scary. Uh, one of the things I did is I convinced the uh, coroner here to uh, send me aortic valves. Uh, and so I would take the aortic valves and I'd put them in a solution, an antibiotic solution, and ship them to California. They'd freeze them and then thaw them out and uh, found out that about 95% of the cells were viable. And we thought, gosh, this is going to be an opportunity to uh, use uh, cell, uh, human aortic valves. You can no more do that today than fly. Um, so, um, so yes, um, I think the, the requirements are much more stringent than they were, but so is all the things that you're trying to innovate. Uh, and it's much more sophisticated. Now, on, on that note, let me just talk about how I think that you're going to see these new things come along. They're not going to come along for just surgeons or just cardiologists. They're going to come along at the border of disciplines. And you're going to see engineers and tissue scientists and uh, cardiologists working together to bring uh, new things, new innovations uh, to the table. And, I encourage people to work with people outside their discipline, uh, if you will, intellectual diversity, um, to begin to think about new ideas and how you bring them to the clinical arena. Um, I think that's going to be the opportunity that we have that is going to be uh, for those of you who want to innovate and how you, uh, and that will require, ultimately, a lot of it's going to require working with somebody commercially because, uh, frankly, we have the ideas and we can develop things, but we're not manufacturers for the most part. Thank you so much, Toby. That was wonderful. My pleasure. And Thank you. Catching up with you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. We'll reconvene in about uh, 12 minutes, and we'll uh, start the next session um, in our conference room. Thank you.